Heritage Conference, and they had, they had given me the title of the lecture, and I didn't really know what it was. I knew what I wanted to do, but they gave me this title, History of Dixie Highway. And then I didn't know it until I got there, so I immediately told them in front of everybody, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> and the reason was, this is Dixie Highway. It goes from Mackinac, that, no, sorry, Sault Ste. Marie to Miami. And if you notice it, it's not one road. The things that call themselves Dixie Highway is a whole collection. Well, to do that would take like two weeks to do a lecture. So I said, I can't do that. So what I'm going to do, uh, I, I'm going to pick it up the Dixie Corridor. And uh, just as, as, as Bob said, from Pontiac up to the, I'll go all the way to the Genesee Line. And kind of talk about the evolution of that road, because you guys are right in the middle of that. So that's what I'll do. So I then I tentatively called it the history of the Oakland County Dixie Corridor. And then I said, that is boring. So I don't like that. Because I'm a historian, and I really don't find the history of a road very fascinating. It's a road. It was dirt, and then gravel, and then paved. But I said, here's what's interesting. The people, and the places, and the events that happened along the road. So the new, improved title is A Fiddler, A Horse Farm, and A Harvest Device. <laughs> That's people, places, and events along the Dixie Corridor. And Matt, you're going to start right in your area. I'm going to start right here in Groveland Township with William H. Green. William H. Green came and settled right there, his family, right along what was then the Saginaw Turnpike. Uh, it had been a Native American trail, and I'll talk a little bit about that, but it had come right up through their land. It came in 1851 in a wagon. Um, real pioneer style, and they built, uh, right there they built a frame house, which is supposedly one of the first frame houses in Groveland Township. And then he married the girl next door, because you did that. That was Martha Hankinson, and there weren't a lot of choices, so a whole lot of people married the girl next door. And that's what he did, he married Martha Hankinson, and then he became kind of famous in Genesee and in Northern Oakland because he had a threshing machine. They were big and they were expensive and not many had them. He was a thresher. And he would rent himself and the thresher out during harvest season. But if you ask William H. Green what his claim to fame was, he'd tell you he was a fiddler. He was the town fiddler for Austin Corners, or Austin. And that's right where Oak Hill comes out. So he always said he was a fiddler for 45 years. So he's kind of my fiddler. And what's good about starting with him is that he's, he's a human being. But here's what I found the most interesting. That little house you saw, William H. Green lived in that house all 80 years of his life. The same, same house. And imagine, he was right on Dixie Highway. When he was interviewed in 1931, just six months before he died, he said he, he loved watching the traffic change. He said in his lifetime, he had watched it change from Indians to tourists and from stagecoaches to motor cars. He saw the whole history there. He talks about Native Americans living in the area, not just passing through, who would come and pay his mother 50 cents to pick currants on their farm because they had a lot of currents in the area. So I thought he was a great starting point for me because in his lifetime, he saw all of the change. So we start with William H. Green, but then we're going to back up in time. Before William H. Green and his family were here, the Saginaw Trail was here, and it ran from Detroit up to the Saginaw Valley. It's probably 600 years old. It began with the Sauk Native Americans, it, way before Detroit, the place that would become Detroit was a Native American settlement. And the main trade was between the Saginaw Valley, which was a huge Ojibwe area, and the Detroit area, which was Potawatomi, Odawa, and Ojibwe. So people had been moving up along the Saginaw Trail. Now the Saginaw Trail was just a rough path, and it followed the path of least resistance. So it wasn't straight like Dixie Highway became. But interestingly enough, in 1817, when they began to survey Oakland County, the surveyors recognized it. They marked it as a dotted line, and sometimes they actually spelled out Saginaw Trail, all with A's, three A's. 
In their journals, they mentioned the Saginaw Trail, so they fully knew it was there. Sometimes they just called it an Indian path. You'll see it on the Groveland survey. This happens to be Waterford, and it would be one run right through. And again, path of least resistance, because when it came to a swamp, what do we do now? We fill in the swamp and we go across. Native Americans went around the swamp. When you went across the river, you found either the shallowest or the narrowest spot. So it's a wiggle-woggly line. Dixie Highway follows it as close as it can, but in many cases, it, 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 it's a straight line, and the trail would have been off to the side. The next place we always look for, for history of an area is a 1931 book. It's an archaeological atlas of Michigan. And this archaeologist took all the existing evidence of, of Native American archaeology that had been discovered from pioneer records, from museums, and this is our little part. Here's the Saginaw Trail. He found some interesting things along the trail. Right here was a Native American village, kind of near south of Naren Lake and Bald Eagle Lake, a significant settlement. Right here at Williams Lake, one at Mesa Lake Lake, and the biggest area right here in Groveland were Native American mounds. They look like this. They were burial mounds. They were buried with a lot of artifacts in them. So some of the most significant ones in Michigan were in Groveland. Now where are they now? They got flattened because farmers found they were in the way. And sadly at that time, farmers didn't realize the significance. They found bones in them, didn't know what that they belonged to, and a lot of them were just leveled. But I'd like to find out more about your mounds because it was a significant collection. Now, the, the archaeologists also said this area, your area of Oakland County, because of its many lakes, was a situation was perfect for idea, ideal for Indian life. A path led to every lake because Native Americans used water. Early writers state that Indian cornfields and sugar camps existed in many parts of the area. So as white settlers came in, these old cornfields were still there. The sugar camps were still there once it had looked like that. So people were not only traveling along the trail, they were living along the trail in your area. Now we know that will change. As pioneers came in, Native Americans were displaced. And we begin to see people like Oliver Williams come in. Oliver Williams was one of the first settlers in Oakland County. He was born just outside of Boston in 1776, good time to be in the colonies. And then he moved in 1805 to Detroit. And his idea, well, he was a merchant, a trader. And he said, I, I want to leave Boston. It's overpopulated. I want to I get where it's exciting. I want to go to the wilderness. And he did. By 1818, he said, I want to go to the wilderness again. Detroit is getting too big. And he headed out our way. He headed out along the Saginaw Trail, settled along Silver Lake. He settled right, right there at the south end of Waterford Township. His intent was to build a trading post. He eventually had a little farm, but he was a trader. He built a, a 20 by 50 log structure. Most log cabins in the time were 20 by 20. This was substantial. He, he intended to, and, and he did start a trading post, trading with Native Americans. And he traded for furs, skins, honey, wax, and maple sugar. Then he took those goods to Detroit, again, along the Saginaw Trail, and retraded them or sold them in Detroit. Now, here's what's interesting to me. His trading post was right here along Silver Lake. Now, when I think of a fur trading post, what, what do you think of when you think of fur trading? Like Mackinac Island and up north and Montreal and Quebec, we had one in Oakland County. They were trading furs right here. I think that's fascinating, right there. Now, on that spot, we think this is exactly where the trading post was. We've identified by a series of maps. But this house has another house inside it. This is a Tudor house, but inside that house is that house. And it was just, and actually inside that house is another house. <laughs> that house is plastered, there's a brick house in the inside. So what we see is what's happened along Dixie Highway in some cases. 
a historic house gets remodeled and gets remodeled. So now it's hard to even see. This is a, a second empire design. Is that and house on Dixie Highway? It's on Dixie Highway. Know, know, Highway. You can see it right up yeah. on the hill. Yeah. It's right there. It belongs to the Salter family now. Now, I had the good luck of being able to dig up the Salter's land for six years. I do archaeology, and they got permission. I, we were determined to find evidence of the trading post. We, were good at, we knew it had a cellar, at least through part of it. We knew there was a barn that had had a foundation. So we spent six years digging up their, their, their yard, several, several test pits, over 16 of them, and trenches from front to back of this particular spot. I even did underground radar. Unfortunately, I didn't find anything except this stuff. No foundation, no cellar. I, but I found this is all pre-1860. The pottery in the bottom is 1830s, 1840s, and then that that glass bottle has a pontal scar where it's been it's been glass blown. Wow. But that's it. But no evidence. So unfortunately, we kind of gave up after six years. Um, and I don't know. There's been so much change in that area. My guess is really that there's a monument there uh, that says that the the Williams barn and house was right behind the rock, but the rock's been moved four times. <laughs> the told me, oh, that's not where it was. I said, where was it? Well, it was over here. But then before that, we're not sure where it was. So the rock was totally useless. <laughs> but we think that the, um, the house that's existing there now was built right on top of the Williams thing. Because if you have a hole in the ground, when you don't have bulldozers, you use the whole ground again. Mm -hmm. So we think probably I, I was looking for something that was already in these people's basement. Oh. Now, what will happen after Oliver Williams? You know what's going to happen. People are going to follow him out here. People realize that this farmland that had originally been said is not very good was really good, and it was cheap. Oliver Williams bought it for $2 an acre. Mm -hmm. And then the federal government said, That's, we're, we're ripping them off. That's too much. And dropped it to a dollar and a quarter. Wow. So just a minute, I hate to even think out here now and along Silver Lake what land costs. But it's way more than $2 an acre. But people will follow them out. And actually, the first people that will settle are related. Alpheus Williams was Oliver's brother-in-law. Oliver Williams married a Mary Williams, and they were very distantly connected. But he had come with Oliver Williams, but he was interested in starting a mill. And he said, a lake is not a good place for a mill. I need a river. So he traveled down almost to the end of Waterford Township, where the Clinton crossed the Saginaw Trail. And he began the community that would become Waterford. That's a, a, a historic, this is Andersonville and Dixie Highway. Right there, that's the post office and the livery. It was a mill town. Waterford began like a lot of Oakland County along river. And it had by 1872 a plaster mill, a sawmill, and a grist mill. So it had a mill history. That will change in a little bit. But besides the mill, it had something else that becomes a pattern along the Saginaw Turnpike, a big hotel. What people were realizing was, people were moving along this road, and it took a long time. It was a rough trail still, and people wanted to stay in a hotel overnight. So in 1841, this hotel would be built. It would be there till 1970 when it was demolished. It burned in 1890 on New Year's Eve, mm -hmm. and but there was there was not enough, uh, so much damage that they decided to repair it and restore it. So it was there until 1970. Some of you may remember the place that was across the street. Yeah. Anybody remember the old mill? Mm -hmm. Now I remembered it when I was very tiny, probably one, um, as a, as a restaurant. And that's what it, it, I remembered it as. But it began, which I didn't know, as a hotel. Mm -hmm. As a hotel and a tavern. And the family, the Dorman family, who built this in the 1920s, while it was being built, they went across the street and they lived in the Waterford Hotel and they ran it. And then when their hotel was done, they left and went across the street and competed with the hotel they had just been running. And then the Waterford Hotel was a big competitor of theirs for a while. Now, 
What's there where the hotel is now? This historic building, <laughs> Steve's Auto Center. But if you go to Steve's and you go right around the corner down Andersonville Road, you will begin to see old Waterford. Yeah. You'll see the 1860s church. That white building was an old foundry. That's Greek revival architecture. And then if you keep going, you'll see these magnificent old 1830s, 1840s Greek revival houses on both sides of the road. So the Waterford Village is one that's still there and visible. That's not true of all the communities. Now right between the Trading Post and the Waterford, another community will start. This one on another place where the Clinton crosses. You know, the Clinton is a wiggle wobbly river, crosses multiple times. And someone named Daniel Windia, he was from England and he was a miller. And when he came to the, uh, to the United States to start a mill, he called his mill Drayton Mill after his one in England. <coughs> and then right around where he built his mill there, would develop Drayton Plains. It was a plains area that, that would become Drayton. And then he would build with his son-in-law, there went the Saginaw Trail, and these communities all have something in common, they're on the trail. Right there, what did it have? A big hotel. Sadly, there's no photo existing that I know of the Drayton Hotel. But just like the Waterford one, it would be an inn for travelers and eventually for stagecoaches. And I love the quote I found. It said, horses would stop to drink there, and so would the passengers. <laughs> and because whiskey was three cents for a tumbler, it didn't take long to fill up. <laughs> so this was a stopping place for the horses and the people. And that will become a pattern. You know, I always think of stagecoaches like in a John Wayne movie. And I realized they were huge in Michigan. I'm just learning about the history of stagecoaches. <laughs> Now here's Drayton Plains' description of this metropolis in 1866. It's a place of no great importance. Yet it is one of the links which go to make up the chain, and one that may at some time, not far distant, be a bustling, lively village. And what they were talking about is the chain of communities that are all connected. All these people were connecting now, community after community. But it did become bustling and lively for a little bit of time. Because while the people of Waterford were, were raising potatoes and apples and shipping them out by rail, Drayton Plains was harvesting and growing something else, ice. Ice was a massive industry. Remember at that time people had ice boxes and ice was cut in the, the lakes around Drayton. There was a huge ice factory, Pittman's and Dean's, right on Loon Lake was located here. Now there's a little marina there. It was a massive ice works. In 1880, 150 train car loads of ice were leaving Drayton Plains every day. And it was all going to Cincinnati. Cincinnati was exclusively buying Drayton Plains ice. Now, of course, it, so it's bustling at that time. But what happened to our ice boxes? Refrigeration. <laughs> Electricity and refrigeration, and then Drayton Plains just came kind of this sleepy town. 1950s, it will shift kind of towards the north. The original Drayton Plains was much further to the south, where the, where the actual, along the train tracks there. Then Drayton will begin to shift to the north, 1950. And you'll see now there's not a lot of change there. We're actually working with Drayton Plains with the economic development to try and work on the frontage there, to try and get some commonality between facade and kind of add a little history there. Now, next, we're going to see a change. Waterford and Drayton were mill towns. Now we go to what I call the tavern towns. These won't have a mill and a river. They're going to start as a hotel, as a little tavern. And why? Because in 1826, the government decided to build a government road between Detroit and Saginaw. And it followed the old Saginaw Trail. By 1833, it was to Flint. Now it was an, an earthen road, but it was able for a stagecoach to get down. And now stages would run from Detroit to Flint, from Flint to Saginaw. And stagecoaches needed stopping spots because it, it took a day to get from Detroit uh, up in, into Oakland County. 
So what we get is stagecoaches need taverns. Now what were these luxury hotels like? Crude and inadequate, but food was abundant and friendliness was the rule. And that's what they were like. These were, were hometown wilderness little taverns. Usually someone built a house and had people staying just in a section of their house. Right here in Springfield would be an example. Asahel Fuller in 1831 built a house and then stayed in just a tiny part of it and used the rest for an inn. And then in what I call one of the early examples of hotel competition, <laughs> Giles Bishop will literally build right next door two years later and they'll compete with each other over time. And that'll be it, two hotels. Well then people said, well maybe that's a good place to settle and Springfield, the community, will grow around the hotels. You know, normally the town comes first, then the hotel comes, or mill town hotel. But here along this area, hotels were first, the little taverns, and then the communities would grow. Springfield, by the 1860s, boasted two merchants, and they were related, the, the Merrill, a Maryland son. They had a physician and a surgeon, Dr. Bartlett. The, white, the big two-story white building on Dixie Highway in Springfield, Dr. Bartlett's office is still there. And that big building exists. And then it had a hotel keeper, it had two blacksmiths, and it had what I found as a maker of stoneware. And I said, what was that? What was a maker of stoneware? So I researched Mr. Harrington. He was a potter. He was one of the few potters in Oakland County, particularly in the north. His specialty was jugs and crocs, it said. So his pottery was going all the way over uh, uh, Oakland County. Now, these guys weren't the claim to fame, no. And go ahead, did you have? No, is that his name, Bartlett? No, he was Harrington. Harrington. He was Harrington. He was the potter. Now, these folks were not the claim to fame of Springfield, though. It would become known because of that farm, the Ellis farm. It will become known throughout Michigan because the farm is literally in town. I mean, the house was right there and the farm was behind it. Norman Ellis had come in the 1870s and purchased, uh, there was already a house on the land, and uh, he was interested in stock breeding. And he started with sheep. And uh, there were a lot of sheep farmers in our area of Oakland County. And then he made a change. This is him and his wife. He decided to go into horses, and he picked Percherons. Percher, and I'm not a horse person, but I've learned these are big draft horses. And there were very few in Oakland County, and people wanted them because we had rocky, heavy soil in many places, and these guys could pull plows through it. Our roads were crummy, and they could get our wagons down the road. So he did hugely successful with his horses, particularly with the first one he bought. He bought Ingomar. Ingomar came from France. He actually ordered it from France. He literally took all the pennies the family had to buy Ingomar, but it was a very good business decision because Ingomar was excuse my language, a super stud. He was amazing. And that's what they used him for, for stud services. They made so much money on just Ingomar that they were able to build the Ellis Barn. This fabulous, it was one of the biggest barns in Michigan. Ingomar's name was up. Ingomar's name was Ingomar's farm. They even were able to build this Italian egg house, which is, was huge. So it was successful. Now, after a while, though, as our roads improved and as we got mechanical tractors, Percherons weren't needed anymore. So they switched to these kind of Tennessee walkers, once used for dressage and for jumping, and that became their specialty. The Dixie Saddle Club, which started in the 1940s for 25 years, would have all their events at the, at the Ellis Farm. Now, the Ellis family sold, sold to two baseball players, Tim Versus and um, uh, Gibson. Yeah, Gibson. And when they bought the land, they agreed in a, to let the Oakland County Parks have the, the barn, and it was dismantled by a group of Amish barn rights from Indiana, taken apart piece by piece, and it was reconstructed at Springfield Oaks. So our barn is still over there. Yes? 
Did you hear the story of when he first got there, he built a small barn, and his neighbors all laughed at him. Exactly. So then he went and got special lumber from all over. From Maine. He got yeah. the design from yeah, Maine exactly. and said, I'll show those people. Yeah, I'll, I'll show them. Barn. Yeah. And it was a huge house. <laughs> Now, what's interesting is the house remains also. It's been moved back. It was moved back. It's there now. It's been, been renovated. It's just back in the Inkomar subdivision now. Now, I dug there also, but I wasn't digging for foundation or cellar. I was digging for the outhouse. I know that seems weird. <laughs> but an outhouse for an archaeologist is a treasure trove. From Jamestown to out west. Outhouses, what happens is you don't have garbage pickup. So when it's in an outhouse, it's going to be close to the house. Because in Michigan winter, you don't go out a half a mile. So they're close. So when you break a plate, you took it out and threw it in the outhouse. You drop stuff down. So after everything had been moved off the property, County Park said, go find the, the privy pit. So we went looking for it. We actually had that, that's the actual privy. So we knew the size of it. And then we essentially, for one blitz of a weekend in May, we got Kirk Gibson and Tim Brutus to agree to let us on the land. They gave us one weekend, and they asked that they could have all the artifacts. But when you see the stuff, you'll see that they've never worried about it. <laughs> <laughs> we screened yards and yards of dirt, and we found a cool rock foundation. But that's not what an outhouse has. And the rock house is not big like this, six by six feet. So we missed the outhouse, but we found this incredible foundation loaded with 6,000 artifacts. Everything from horse mange medicine to shoes to 14 different kinds of ceramic dinnerware, all kinds of stuff. Just piles of it. You'll see it, you'll see it in a minute. Oh now this was taken, we dug in, in 2013. This was taken three weeks ago. We are still going through the artifacts. <laughs> I have a little history core out at Independent Zoos. We are still sorting, classifying, numbering, and in some cases gluing together the Ellis stuff. It'll be like 10 years before I get through those boxes. Oh my now here's what we think we found, <coughs> the building next to it. That right there, that was there too. We thought we were in the right case, place because we measured and measured. We found this one. This is an ice house. This is an ice house because this went down probably eight feet in the ground. That's what we found. Rock foundation, rock on the top. And then what happened was when the Ellis family got electrical refrigerator, they started using it for the dump. Because the artifacts there are from 1915 to 1940. So it, it was used in the same way a privy would have been used. But I, I missed the privy there. Oh my gosh. So now we're going to go way up there. Stony Run. I had never heard of Stony Run. Um, so I said, I'm going to have to do some serious research here since I don't even know that community exists. But how did it start? It was near the Genesee border, right on Saginaw Turnpike. Smith, Jenks, and Thomas Irish, they built a hotel. There wasn't one in the north yet. They built a little tavern in 1834, just three years after Springfield gets started. And then it becomes a stagecoach stop. Very early on, here's the actual cheap and rapid riding. Uh, Mr. Petty and Mr. Ross were in charge of the stagecoach run between Flint and, um, and Pontiac. And then you can see uh, Gro uh, Groveland is listed on there too. We'll get to you in a minute. But Stony Run becomes a, a spot. Now notice it says you could leave, the, the, leave Flint in the morning. And this was so rapid that you could make it to Pontiac to catch the train to Detroit. The stagecoaches had stopped running now between Pontiac and Detroit because the train was more efficient. So you took the stage to Pontiac from Flint, then you got on the train. So if you were lucky, you could on the morning up get on Flint and by six o'clock at night you'd be in Pontiac. Now 
It might have been cheap, but I can't call that rapid. I just can't call that rapid travel between Flint and Pontiac. I mean, think what we can do that in now on I-75. But it, at that time, because the road was so rough, that was considered a great way to travel. The Stony Run, there is a Stony Run schoolhouse still. There is a house now. It, it's right? a, uh, there's a, yes, I'm going to show you what's left of Stony Run. Okay. So here it is on the map. Why did it get its name? Vast quantities of loose stone and boulders. And that just plagued farmers it has throughout this area forever. But later on would be huge business because of the gravel in the area. Now that's turned into a new economic activity. It was right in here. It ran, it started at Belford Road and then went to the north. It's almost impossible to see anything there now. There's just that one building. Now that building, if I'm reading the map right, was an odd fellows hall. That's the last thing it was. Other than that, there's no evidence that there was a town there. It had a blacksmith shop, it had a, its hotel, there were businesses. So it, there's no visible evidence except one building. But here's what I've learned. After the structures in the village are gone, the stories are still there. And I've been finding great stories. My favorite story of Stony Run is about the Fagan brothers. John and Thomas Fagan were of Irish descent. And I noticed when I did Hadley Cemetery, which you'll see in a minute, that they both died on the same day in February. Well, to a historian, that says, you cannot let this go. You've got to find out why two people in their 80s died on the same day. So I went to research the Fagan brothers. They're buried right here. You're all familiar with Hadley Cemetery. I love this. you got the best cemetery sign here. Residence only after sunset. It's a classic. But buried up on that hill are the Fagan brothers. They came from New York in 1832, right along when you're hearing all this history. And they settled here along Belford Road. That's Belford running between John to the north, Thomas to the south. And they had, um, they shared a farmhouse. And what I learned about them was, they right outside of Stony Run, they were very frugal, which is maybe why they just built one house and shared it. But they had, they had made considerable money, and they were very efficient farmers. And they had taken their money and put it in a bank in the 1830s. Then there was a problem. 1837, if you know your Michigan history, the banks crashed. It was the Panic of 1837, and they lost all their money. It, it, was, it was gone. So the Fagan brothers said, we're losing our trust in banks. We're going to do that again. In fact, we're losing our trust in farming. And they went to sea. And they stayed sailors for a long period of time. But they were frugal. And what do you have to spend your money on if you're a sailor? So they accumulated this big pile of money again. And then they decided to return home to the same house on Belford. They came back. And then did they put the money in the bank? I don't know. No. Didn't put the money in the bank, and so the neighbors said, I wonder where those Fagan brothers are hiding that money. But anyway, they lived there, again, kept the farm going. But then in the winter of 1893, it was a terrible, terrible winter in, in, in Michigan. There was a huge blizzard in February. And when the blizzard was finished, the neighborhood neighbors went to check on them. And both of them had frozen to death in their house. Oh. And that's what had happened to them. And they, they weren't sure, but they, they decided to give the same death date of February 24th. Now, as the newspapers reported, a search for money began a few days after. <laughs> Because they said there's money there. So they went looking for it, and they found it in wool in the barn, packed away in wool, oh, under gosh. hidden floorboards in the barn, lots of mason jars in different places. Now, the money didn't belong to those treasure hunters, so. Now, the reason they thought it would is they didn't think they had any heirs. They were both bachelors. But they had a brother, Peter, who had died just after them, and he had children. So the money was divided among the, 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 the Peter Fagan's children. Now, here's what people have been asking me recently. Why were you digging for the, the Williams cellar? That was a failure. You never found the outhouse. Maybe you should have been out on Belford Road <laughs> digging in the Fagan backyard. That probably, there could be more there. I have to think about that one. You know, my mother used to bury gold coins. 
Oh, yeah. In, under the bird bath in the garden in a bag. And like tin that. cans. Every once in a while you read about that. And I'd say, well, you better tell us where they are because if something happens to you. <laughs> we we, we <laughs> I can't find them. <laughs> now, but the Fagan brothers are still with us because if you've been to Great Lake Cemetery, that's Fagan Lake right at the cemetery. Oh. And you notice on the right, Fagan Rose. And that's it. Sometimes people are gone, but they're really here still. They're here in a lake, and they're here on a road. So they're still here. And now, come to Groveland. How, what was your start? Philip McComber built a large log house and used it as an inn. It becomes known as Groveland Cottage. You'll even see on the map it's labeled Groveland Cottage. Now, why a log hotel was called a cottage, I don't know. I haven't solved that one yet. But it was very famous. It's listed in lots of things as Groveland Cottage. Are the two houses that are still there, I know they're going to get gone because it's a new war, but were they part of that? Was it a village there? Sorry. It's a, Groveland Corners was a village. It okay. was definitely a village. But you'll see on, on the map, it had blacksmith shops, blacksmith shops. It had, it had the hotel. There were little businesses there. But here it is now. There's just very, very little there. That was where, right where the hotel was, Groveland Cottage. Oh my God. Now, oh, let me, let me not go there yet. So is that Grange Hall? And That's Grange Hall and, 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 and example. So it, was, it became known as both Groveland, but mainly Groveland Corners. So it was a village, but again, it's just like Stony Run. If you can't find it, but what can you find? The stories. And my favorite one is about your first dance in Groveland Township. It was 1834 at William Husted's, uh, the Husted family. He lived right on the Saginaw Turnpike. So what they said, if we're going to have a dance, we need music. So according to the 1877 history of Oakland County, the settlers sent to Genesee for a fiddler, and his name was Cronk. But when they got there, he wasn't home. So they came back and they said, we don't have any music for the dance. But two pioneer women said, well, since we have to have music of some kind, we're going to volunteer to sing dancing tunes for you. But there was one problem. They only knew two songs. <laughs> so according to the history, it says they made the most of circumstances, those tough pioneers, and they tripped the light fantastic toe, the repeated strains of those two pieces. What a great story, though. The other thing is William Husted is buried right near the Fagan Brothers in Hadley Cemetery. So all these pieces begin to intertwine now. Now, something else happened at Groveland Corners. This was Hannah Lennon's farm. She'd owned it since 18, 1840s. She was all, all around the little village was Hannah's land. Eventually, Lamar, Dr. Lamar Matthews would purchase that land. He was an eye specialist, and he, specialized, he was one of the first people in Michigan to specialize in correcting crossed eyes of children. Mm -hmm. He had a clinic in Pontiac, and he wanted to move out here. He wanted to farm and he wanted to have a clinic out here. So he bought the, the farm, and then he, he had, in, had a few cows, he had some chickens, and he had a lot of concrete animals, it said. It said he had a fascination with concrete things. So there were a lot of animals that weren't live, but they were, but they were there. And then, oh, not quite yet, he, he decides his tax bill is, is too high for him, for his family, so he makes it a private club. He builds three little concrete um, structures on, on, on Grange Hall Road. They're gone now. And he starts a private membership, but it doesn't go well. So then he turns it into a resort called Groveland on the Dixie, which I had never heard of. And he takes Stewart Lake and makes it bigger. He brings in, has the Purvis excavators, who are still out here, bring in sand, build a big beach, he builds a windmill on an island and rents it as a honeymoon cottage. And he develops this whole area for him. Now his office is still there. It, he's your, it's your fire department. That was, that was Dr. Matthews' building at that time. Is there anything else other than the, the one part of it where the gas station, is there any building still there? No, 
No, it's with that. those little yeah. houses, the two farmhouses that are vacant, but oh no, one's lived in. Right. Were they part of that settlement? That well, the, 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 across uh, from the fire department. That, across from there, that farm isn't as old as it looks. Okay. It's not there in 1896 on the map okay. at least. Okay. And here's what's interesting yes. about Stony Run and Groveland and the last one we're going to do is that normally there's more evidence behind when a village has been there. And I haven't figured that out because there's no reason some of those structures would be gone, like the blacksmith shop. They're still in Waterford. They still have a schoolhouse in the old town. There's an old, the yeah. school, the Groveland school is still there. It's further down to the south. They're together, like the town of Paul and Ex the Ex right? Exactly. Now, Groveland on the Dixie would become, oh wait, Paradise Beach. This is how they advertised it. I want you to see it was a big, a big advertising campaign. And what we're going to see now, that turns into Groveland Oaks Park. That was, Groveland on the Dixie just becomes the park. But what you see here is a change along Dixie. No longer did they need those little taverns. So here's what they started built. These were gone. What had gone? These were coming in. And we get a huge change, like Deer Lake Inn, in, out by Clarkston. Now we become a tourist spot for people who are driving out on a Sunday afternoon. Notice motor out today to Deer Lake Inn. Another one, 30, 35 miles from Detroit. This had really something interesting. It says, Deer Lake is a thousand feet above Detroit making it an ideal health resort. <laughs> I never thought a must be in a health resort at a thousand feet. But those were the ways they were getting people to come here. Mineral Spring. Exactly. Mineral Spring. Here's another one. Come out today just 90 minutes from Detroit to Clarkston. And it was now because we we're seeing a major change. Now we'll begin to see things like this. The motels around there. The park land is still there. Most of these are efficiency apartments now. But if you look, the signs are, uh, are often still there. And then we'll see restaurants come in, like this one. This is still there. This is on Loon Lake, Howard Johnson's. Look how much it still looks like that. This yeah. lawyer's office. You can still tell that descriptive Howard Johnson's. Yeah. And then, in one in Waterford and one in Pontiac along Dixie, the drive-ins. Yeah. I saw many a good horror movie at yeah. that one. Yeah. This is interesting, because there's a remnant of this one. This is an aerial view, and it's hard to see in this light, but if you look closely, the circles are still there. From the aerial, when you're on that piece of land, you can't see it. But when you're up above it, you can still see the drive-in part. Oh and then we have one more. We got Austin's Corners. That was the last little one. That was 1837. And that's at Oak Hill. That's right on the border of, of um, Groveland and, and Springfield. This began again. Thomas Twilliger built a hotel at the Corners, called, named it after himself. And then it becomes both Austin Corners and Austin. Now the name comes from David and Horatio Wright. And there's two stories in history. One is that they named it after their mother, whose maiden name was Austin. The other one is that David Austin Wright named it after himself. So it's hard to tell uh, in history, but it becomes Austin Corners or Austin Post Office. The Twilliger house is still there. Twilliger's <laughs> house, and right next to it is a fabulous house, the Horatio Wright house, which is being lovingly restored by Mr. Sash back here. That is a fantastic house. They're doing an amazing job on that house. So we have some two significant structures at Austin that are still there. Two houses that are still there. Now, what happened to Twilliger's tavern? Well. Notice this name. Mr. Petty bought it. He was the one who was running the stage between Flint and Pontiac. He needed a halfway point to have a horse changing. Because they, they, besides stopping for the for people along the way, you had to have a halfway point where you switched horses in those days. So Austin Corners began as a horse switching place at that time. Now there's not much left there at Austin Corners, besides the two houses and the school. But right at the corners, the blacksmith is gone, the hotel is gone. You've got the township sign. Which corner was the hotel this corner? Here? The hotel, from what I can see, it's not marked on a map. 
was right across from there, was in the same, uh, actually be the northeast, no, northwest corner. And it's not perfectly north-south there. And again, here's that Oak Hill, there's very little, little evidence. But what happens? The stories remain. And my favorite one, of course, takes us back where we begin, William H. Green, who was the fiddler at Austin Corners. So I kind of started my research, and then as I went chronologically, I ended right back with William H. Green. So what we had was something we saw, just like I talked about, from Indians, and then to tourists, and from stagecoaches to motor cars. So we had a, a fiddler, and a horse farm, and a harvest of ice. Thank you.